Thank you very much, Helga. Um, right, so um, we're going to do this a little bit different. Uh, so uh, we're going to do our talks, then we're going to flip the room, and you're going to have some stuff to say, uh, hopefully. So prepare some questions straight away. Um, what tends to happen with these things, when you go and give a lecture in a fine art course, is the room is deathly sort of silent when you say any questions. So uh, that won't happen this time, so please prepare a question. Um, I'm Simon Poulter, and um, I am an artist, curator, and consultant uh, in different orders. I'm also a director of Collusion, which is um, another art and technology company based in Cambridge. Um, I have worked um, for a similar amount of time to Rebecca in digital media. Um, and I think my, I'm very focused on outcomes. So the outcome I would like from this talk is to maybe drill down a bit and not have that overwhelming thing. I do agree with that. So we're going to try and drill down into some real stuff. So I'm going to invite my uh, guests to um, say who they are. I'm Cathy Wade, and I'm an artist and collaborator. Um, hi, I'm Ruth Catlow. I'm an artist and co-founder of Furtherfield, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a minute. Hello, my name is Sonia Barrett. I'm a visual artist and um, I've just recently started a, a black art space in Germany. Um, I'm Ian Sargent. I'm a cinema producer, curator and PhD student here. Uh, so I don't know if this is by design, because I, I didn't put this panel together, but I know everybody here except Sonia, um, which is encouraging. Uh, so um, uh, the thing about this uh, conference is about identity. Um, I was invited to write a blog, uh, which I did, and it's up there if you want to have a look at it. So um, I am baby punk generation. I was born in 1963. I spent a lot of time uh, in East Anglia in fields where I met lots of very strange people doing performance art. Um, people like Lowell Coxill um, and Dave Rappaport and sort of all manner of people who were doing sort of incredible things. I was about 17. I had no idea of the quality of the people that I was encountering in weird fields in East Anglia. Um, my little daughter, Honor, who's uh, just about to be seven, is currently pestering me to play Fortnite all the time. Uh, there will be other uh, parents in this room who will be familiar with the virus, which is called Fortnite. It is a game which, once you pick it up, you can't put it down. Um, it's, uh, what I was trying to do in the blog was to compare my own uh, period of growing up in fields and playing guitars in punk bands with uh, a kind of data-driven culture where in Fortnite, if, uh, for those of you that haven't played it, you jump out of a bus over an island and there are a hundred other people and then the island gradually diminishes and the objective of the game is to kill everybody else. <laughs> okay? That wasn't the objective when I was a baby punk in a field. Um, with my two younger children, I'm trying to persuade them to look at this tactically where we now play it and we try and hide so we don't get killed. And we managed to get down to the last 11, but it's really difficult not to get killed in that, that last 10. So I'm very interested in how uh, technology can be manipulated and uh, redevised actually in terms of practice and also thinking about parenting. So those are the, the difference in the situations is that my uh, daughters are encountering this kind of stuff and that's what they want to play but that doesn't mean that I can't s persuade them to think about the objectives of the game and actually change them okay so um, one of the things that I, I was going to mention a couple of uh, bits and pieces this panel is um, about technological diversity um, Lara I think thought I was being a bit cheeky when I drilled into this because I, I do know a bit about technology and Technological diversity isn't just about people, it's actually about the programming languages that you use to build software. And this is actually a problem. So, for example, uh, corporations quite often get a monopoly of people who, who know C-sharp. Uh, people who are a bit hacky, they might know JavaScript and Python. 
And what you're trying to do in a programming environment is not get everybody who uses the same programming languages. You want people to be creative. So diversity in technology is not just about people. It's about the stuff that you use. And we were just having a little joke here. There's a PC behind us which is bound to crash, <laughs> definitely. Okay? We know that there are people on this panel who are Linux users. They have very strong opinions. Okay, I've used a Mac all my life because I'm an artist. Okay, so technology does have, uh, sort of it's imbued with a particularity about it. And of course, the diversity aspect comes into it in re relation to people. Um, because we all know that, largely speaking, tech corporations are driven by lots of white blokes. I am a single white male. Okay, and I'm on this panel. Um, so, um, thank you. You're the only one. I'm, I'm the token male, yeah. So, um, we know that that's the pro. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from Ian. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, we we're going there, so we're getting there now. So, um, where I'm heading with this is that, that obviously uh, the next panel is actually about artificial intelligence and it, it sort of creeps over into this one because uh, last year we were talking about VR and AR, getting very excited at this conference. This year we kind of are on the kind of like technology is evil, okay? So we're hearing a lot of people like that. So technology isn't entirely evil. It is what you make of it, actually. And I, I want to contest the fact that drones are just here to spy on us. You can do some really cool things with drones, actually. Um, so there's ways to actually uh, use that kind of stuff. Um, but where I'm heading is um, artificial intelligence. One of the kind of zeitgeists this year, for the record, is bias in, bias out. So um, if you have uh, loads of white blokes coding away, throwing orange balls and playing tennis and whatever they do, going down sort of ski jump rides, they will inevitably program in the bias to the machines. And this has actually been quite well documented now that within artificial intelligence there is a considerable problem with that. So I think this panel is going to hit on some of those diversity issues. And then secondly, um, we're in a kind of situation where we need to think about how we change the sort of people who are making this kind of stuff and critiquing it. So I have some good news. Um, I'm working in Cambridge. There's um, an organisation called the Leverhulme Centre for Future Intelligence, lcfi.ac.uk. They are employing a whole bunch of people, very diversely, to critique all of this stuff. They're not just techie people. They've got uh, anthropologists, sociologists, philosophers. So there is a counter wave now in academia and in this room of people who want to challenge some of these paradigms. Okay? So I'm now going to hand over to Cathy and she's going to do Thank her presentation. You. Okay, so before I started, I really wanted to echo something that Gabby Nakobo spoke about at the Berlin Biennial, which was her citation as a message to the future of the banner held by Roads Must Fall that had the statement, Dear History, this revolution has women, gays, queers, and trans. Remember that. So I'm gonna stand up for two reasons. One, I've kind of asked for the lights to go down slightly, not because I want to do some bad impression of some sort of genius bar inspirational <laughs> TEDx speaker, but because this was designed as a visual document and I want it to remain as such. Part of what I'm wanting to do is talk to this space. So this kind of space that quite often we tend to be very polite about, that we become implicated in, this kind of rather banal imagining of what the internet does. What I wanted to look at is how could I construct a document that is made from the dominant images that appear on the internet. So when you search for something, we're talking about the first five images that appear. And of course, you notice immediately there's something about the authority of that hand. That hand is controlling all of these wonderful technological opportunities. But we also need to question the fact that it's been about for rather a while now. Let's get this finally. So we have an acknowledgement of what it's been doing. 
And I think part of what I wanted to look at is why is it <coughs> really since over centuries and centuries this image hasn't changed and this dominant image hasn't shifted. So we're still talking about that kind of sense of God, the universe image is created as such. And it's also a question about what is happening in terms of pointing. So let's try this again. Okay, so here they are, they're now catching up with us. So I wanted to think of this kind of sense of who is doing this pointing and where they appear from and what it is that they say and why is it so often we think of this image of ourselves and we think of this image of technology and business and we keep falling into these tropes and quite often we excuse them. So really that sense where we could be questioning this situation as to why it's happening and why it's happening within it, we're silent. So it increases the likelihood of more of this, a bit like bad weather, it just occurs again. So what I became interested in is in a space where things are pointed out and in a space where things are explained, what kind of remains as an exception and what remains faulty. And I think one thing that we should consider here in any kind of engagement with a kind of culture that doesn't fully represent us as we are is how that culture sees us and how it speaks back to us. I think one of the texts that is really seismic here is that kind of sense of the way that Rebecca Solnit collects the sense of how women are seen as speaking. This idea of this manipulative, malicious, conspiratorial, congenitally dishonest. Just watch Love Island. It's present constantly. So again, this kind of sense of how these spaces leak, that do we risk this sense with a digital, just as physical online spaces, that we just replicate something. We replicate the space that we exist within, and we duplicate it, we exclude. So here, I think this kind of sensibility comes in of structure and how we work with structure and how in a way quite often we kind of feel that structures are just immediately dissolvable, that you can have a good argument and they start to collapse. Whereas structures actually do something way more formal. The images at the start show how something's existed for centuries and centuries. So how do we dismantle something? And it can't just be by addressing it or breathing on it. How do we cause this state of collapse? I think, again, that kind of sensibility of where this comes from, where it starts, how long it takes, the duration of it, what we're invested in, whether we're talking about our generation, whether we're talking about the generation previous to us, or the three, four generations yet to come. And there comes a question with this of politeness. And how often do you sit in a situation in which you politely tolerate something? And how often do you tolerate something in a system that wasn't made for you, doesn't describe you? Audrey Lord in the Master's House sets up this distinct notion that the Master's House can't be dismantled with the Master's tools. This is always worthwhile referring to. Why would something in power give you the tools to dismantle it, why would it open up and share a space with you and do that without any form of resistance? Why should that space be open? How is it open to us? How do we actually resolve this, reduce this to something that we can utilize? So here I wanted to refer to the sense of what politeness does and that politeness of anything just makes something more endearing, it makes something last for longer, it actually gives this palpable permission to something to exist. So surely now, like within Irene Haydock's book, there's a point in which politeness needs to stop. So polite art does, we don't need to do with it. I also wanted to outline another approach, so possibly with the sense of putting together a load of images that do explore a structure, I wanted to think about how we actually get out of it. So this sense of work that points when we don't get to point back needs an exit point for us. 
So here, heterosterol gives one, and I still rest with this in every single circumstance. Literally, when you have a situation that wasn't built for you, wasn't made for you, there's a sense of what do you invest in it. In the Tara Total Design, she puts forward this notion that you can just send in a holding text. This is what I propose as a resolve to this situation. You use your brain power for something stronger, for something better, and you phone in a holding text, and you let that take place, and you let that also just shut down. Thank you. Thanks, Cathy. Um, now, uh, Ruth Catlow is going to talk. Hello, everyone. I'm having a really fantastic time here today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, OK, so I think we've established that technological diversity can be taken to mean many things. Uh, I'd like to propose... I've got five minutes. So let's... I'd like to state that diversity... We'll, we'll state that diversity is an intrinsic good. Uh, whether we're talking about diversity of variety of humans, backgrounds, perspectives, uh, biodiversity, or of technology, so coding languages, devices, technological cultures. And why? Because diversity is evidence of life. And we're not just talking about a collection or an assemblage of different things. We're talking about a variety of interactions, the effects that they have, and the polyphony that they produce. This, we, we feel in our gut, this is a good thing. Okay, so, um, I'm also going to propose that we can create more diversity by approaching all the technologies we use with an att attitude of critical play, uh, and by looking for opportunities for collaboration and playing with. Um, I wasn't expecting that slide. <laughs> uh, that's the slide I was expecting. It, it's bound to be... Uh, just ignore that. Okay, so um, I'm an artist, co-founder of Furtherfield. Uh, we're an organisation that asks critical questions about art and technology, and we invite other people to do the same through exhibitions, labs and debate. Uh, we grew up with the web, so since the mid-90s, with artists, techies and activists around the world, and have always been inspired by uh, cultures of openness and collaboration, uh, very inspired by free and open source software development, and our physical space is a bar based in the heart of Finsbury Park in North London. This is an area in which 180 languages are spoken, uh, it's officially a super diverse area, which means there's many different kinds of diversity producing all kinds of diversity. And I kind of wanted to show it to you because the physical place is really important here. Um, okay. So, in the, so, it started in the mid-90s with the web, and then in the mid-noughties, we invited people through an open call to participate in uh, the Do It With Others email art exhibition. So, Daiwo, Do It With Others, is a progression from the punk DIY spirit that Simon was talking about. This is the spirit of tool building, make your own culture on your own terms, and uh, towards a more collaborative process. Uh, the graphic shows that we'd come to understand the web as a so it's really a social object or a social space that made the concept of the artist as an individual genius old and unuse unuseful to us. And this network of nodes is made up, so the network of nodes represented here and that we were working with with the web was made up of many different categories of things. Uh, so, and... So we have tools, we have a philosopher, we have the hysteric, we have the talking dildo as a kind of a nod to an, an homage to the role that porn played into the web, you know, the, the kind of libidinal forces. And uh, it acknowledges that culture is produced collaboratively between people, between places, tools, technical concepts, creatures and environments. And this 
complex ecosystem of feeling, meaning, and power, uh, power flows are all operating in these kind of feedback loops. I, I mean, I think we're new into network culture. I feel like the, the world is now behaving like a toddler. Basically, I think global culture is at toddler level. It's we're, we're, we're in a new communi community and production system that works really fast, and we're really learning how to operate in this new system. Um, so, if I can... Um, in Felix Stolder's book, Digital Conditions, he talks about how 70s activists adopted hybridity as a strategy for getting better identity politics. And I think this is a move that really foreshadows how many people are using social media. And hybridity, we, we might call, it, it definitely connects with intersectionality. And this is, hybridity is also held up by Donna Haraway in her feminist... Uh, feminist technology tract, The Cyborg Manifesto, which was written in 1984, in which, by colluding with and building affinities with machines and their cultures, we might avoid the hazards of essentialism and feminine purity, which create more identity straitjackets and would kind of perpetuate marginalisation. So it's kind of looking for a messier way forward. And in her recent book, Staying with the Trouble, Making Kin with the Cthulhu Scene, which I strongly recommend, uh, she goes a step further and suggests that we befriend technologies as a degrowth strategy to make kin not babies. I think it's quite radical. Um, in his new book, Technology at the End of the Future, which I think come, was, is launching today, a bit he gave us uh, some, he wrote about it in The Guardian recently. James Bridal shows how humans might pair up with technologies to develop everyday superpowers. We saw Lulu talking about superpowers earlier. And uh, th those superpowers that we'll need to face uh, various planetary scale challenges. And he gave the example of Centaur, which is Gary Kasparov's response to being beaten at chess by a supercomputer. So Kasparov now plays against supercomputers with the aid of some very average chess programs, and he's never expected to lose again. So the centaur is this kind of combo character. Um, so, with these things in mind, why does Paula Crutchlow, the artist of this work, uh, subject Kayla, the doll your child can ask anything they like and expect an answer, um, as long as it's about shopping or something girly, uh, why does she subject this doll to such a thorough dismantling? And why does artist Pip Thornton, whose work is a study of capitalism's use of language and algorithms, have such a horror of thinking with Google, as demonstrated in last week's tweet, the horror, the horror, think with Google? Um, so, back in the 90s, the US artist collective Critical Art Ensemble described the idea of the data body. So, this is the shadow body that grows inadvertently, is created by our interactions with the web, and it, it's informed by our online actions, but persists over time. So, it can act against us in ways that we don't anticipate. Uh, this photograph... Oh, dear... <laughs> This photograph of uh, Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg at his most cheerful, um, <laughs> apparently it's his favourite photo, and I think this gives us our, our best clue of kind of why uh, Paula Crutchlow and Pip Thornton are, are kind of freaked out. Um, this is a hall full of delegates at a 2016 mobile phone conference, and they're all wearing VR headset, headset, headsets and are engrossed by the content unaware, apparently, of Zuckerberg moving amongst them. Um, and I think it's the perfect metaphor for the operating logic of Facebook. So the spectacle of social interactions that we are all creating or involved in, um, it distracts us from what the platform is actually doing behind the scenes. It, it also induces a conformity in its users and as we know recently from the Cambridge Analytica, Analytica scandal, uh, we don't know how our social interactions are being used against us. 
And I'm picking on Facebook, as a number of people have done, just because it's a recent and we all remember what happened. But it could be many other providers or the ubiquitous mobile phones and devices that we use. We're, that we're, they're all at it. And this matters because digital technologies shape our technology. They promote the values of those who fund, build, and own them, but they f affect the lives of us all. So I'm going to finish up by uh, saying that we need to play an experiment. We need to make friends of our tools and at the same time really attend to how they're changing us, how they're changing the way we behave with each other. And I'll finish with this quote from... Uh, Rachel O'Dwyer. Um, she says, because there's no magic app, and I've changed it a bit, for planetary scale cooperation. This is the thing, the thing that we really need right now. I mean, it's, it's commonly understood with climate change. We need to do planetary scale cooperation, and we don't know. We're, we're not getting there yet. Uh, and there never will be. There's not going to be a magic app for it. We need to find ways to embrace not only technical solutions, but also people who have experience in community organizing and methods that foster trust, negotiate hierarchies, and embrace difference. Thank you. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm currently a, research, a PhD researcher at Birmingham City University in the Faculty of Art and Design and Media. The title of my research is Visual Representations and Cultural Reconstructions of Black Masculinity in 21st Century Birmingham. I've said that to people often, and I kind of, it almost comes out like a rap at the moment. Um, so this practice-led study places Birmingham as a site of cultural significance in the context of black British migration and the emergence of the black art group in the early 1980s. Can you see that? Ish. Anyway, um, the Black Art Group, which included Eddie Chambers, Keith Piper, Marlon Smith, and Donald Rodney, was one of the first groups of black British artists to challenge the socio-political narratives of race and identity, which would influence future generations of black visual artists. Through a written thesis, socially engaged arts practice, and an eventual curated exhibition, I aim to explore uh, young black male identity asking to what extent is place, and in this case Birmingham, a signifier making of these identities. As recent studies of post-industrial inner city and rural locations of Britain suggest, place is often implicitly implicated but rarely considered for its role in shaping young men's practices, trajectories and aspirations. The aim of this study is to contribute to literature and visual arts practice in, a relation, in relation to black masculinity, identities, and representations in a major city outside of, Birmingham, outside of London. Utilizing an approach of mixed methods of autoethnography, fieldwork, and textual analysis, the objective is to address and or answer the following related key questions. To what extent is the black art groups of the 1980s useful in framing constructs of contemporary black male identities? What do young black men understand by the term masculinity? What influences young black males in creating their, their masculine identities? And how are these masculine identities negotiated in their communities and through their use of popular music? My, my research is a continuation from an exhibition in 2016 I curated uh, re-imaging re Donald Rodney, which focused on the digital embodiment of Rodney's art and was the first UK exhibition to specifically examine Rodney's digital practice, exploring the potential of his archive as a starting point for interrogating cultural, physical, and social identity. Rodney was considered to be one of the most significant artists of his generation who chose to incorporate his medical condition of sickle cell regarded as an emblematic black disease in his artistic practice, using as a metaphor of black emasculation and racial stereotyping. He also highlighted the socio-political condition of Britain in the 1980s and 90s, its colonial past and the ensuing global impact. Sadly, Rodney died uh, from sickle cell anemia in March 1998, aged 37. 
The exhibition aimed to engage a new generation with historical important visual arts practice and the key exhibition themes of digital legacy and identity were addressed through a reassessment of key technology enabled works originally produced in the 1990s. Rodney's innovation in the face of the disabling, life-limiting he life health condition of sickle cell anemia informed new commissions to support collaborative digital practice with Wolverhampton Sickle Cell Care and Activity Centre. The commissions referenced the interdisciplinary methods Rodney brought together in order to facilitate his practice, specifically the art-making collective Donald Rodney PLC, comprising of, Keith, of artist Keith Piper, Gary Stewart, and technologist Professor Mike Phillips. Works in the, in the exhibition included DoubleThink, a bespoke online uh, site designed and developed during the workshop as part of the research process with participation of members of Wolverhampton Sickle Cell Care and Activity Centre, which was presented alongside AutoIcon, the original digital archival, create, archival website created in 1998 by Professor Phillips and the members of Donald Rodney PLC. AutoIcon was created specifically as a digital repository of archival artefacts related to Rodney, Rodney and Phillips, as students of Slade School of Art, were inspired by Jeremy Bentham, its founder, who left instructions for his own immortalization through the creation of his auto-icon. Phillips states, the Rodney auto-icon is fashioned from the body of medical information gathered over a lifetime by assembling a virtual body who will be able to exist in pure information space. Reimaging Donald Rodney raised questions and and supported audiences to explore how digital technologies enable, redefine, and extend the creative potential of artists disabled by circumstances that are social, physical, and situational. This aspect was explored through artist talks, screenings, and a symposium to examine the scope of digital tools to, ex to extend artistic practice for marginal artists. Through the exhibition and events, we sought to create a space where people could engage with and contribute to critical discourse and identity representation, art and health. Thank you all. And just to say that this is um, dedicated to two uh, young men who passed during the research and delivery of the project over since 2016 and 2018 from Sickle Cell. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, I mean, most of you will have a mobile device now. If you want to see the images I'm talking about, you can use your phone and look at www.sebarrett.com. Okay, could you all do that, actually? That's quite a nice way of doing the... Yeah. Um, so, w, maybe you could write it for the yeah. board. W, w, oh, you can't, that's not working at all. <laughs> Has anyone got a blackboard? <laughs> yeah, that would be great, yes. Okay, so www.sebarrett. Um, it shouldn't be. All, it might work anyway. Dot net. Or or dot com. Either way should work. Okay, so um, I perform furniture. I was going to ask this question. Answer this question. Um, if we're working. If we're using iterative modes of production, um, then are we, are we going to be inclusive just because of the way that we're working? Uh, my, my, my answer really is that um, no, because iterative modes of production happen in looped spaces all the time. I mean, the art world is full of iterative spaces, of loops of people talking to each other and people being outside. Um, my production is digital and not digital, but it's always iterative. It's always in communication with communities, with black communities, um, and it can't be foreseen without their input. So um, I, I started working digitally when I lost my studio. Um, losing my studio is uh, something that's very much tied to, tied, well, losing studio space is tied to identity. So as, a, um, as someone who doesn't have any um, resources sometimes, it, it became a really easy place to work to, so I could just take my laptop and start to make work. So I started to work and make GIFs. Some of the GIFs you might be able to see. So actually, what was really interesting for me is that my work has been shown primarily in the Caribbean um, and not in Europe. 
Um, and this has enabled me to be in community with other artists of the diaspora and um, with communities in diaspora because they're not in art centers and they are online. So um, it's really powerful to start to, to make in this way because um, you're claiming for yourself not only the, um, the means of production, but the means of distribution. So it, it, this working in this way, like losing everything and getting this, was really, really powerful for me. I started to work on small gifts, make small gifts for myself or to, as a quick response to situations. And these are all performances of chairs or performances of furniture. So I have some, there is a gif, I, I can't see what you're seeing because we're not on the same page, but there is a, um, a gif of a woman doing chair pose. It could be a woman, it could be a man. The gender changes, the, uh, the race changes. What is chair pose? Um, as it, what does it mean when you reach for the sky? How does that change according to your identity? So I wanted to bring that complexity into a digital space. And I wanted to do it without having to answer to anybody. I also made um, a, 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 a gif whereby um, it's a challenge to an 18th century painting whereby there's a man who's performing a chair in the painting. He's actually clothed in the same colour as all the furniture that the white plantation owners are sit, sitting on in front. And so my work with the gif was to, was to somehow liberate him from his chair pose. So you may see he actually leaves the chair pose and, he, and there's a moment where he enters into a space of drag um, and then he um, exits that room using one of the 18th century pictures on the wall in that space. So um, that was a, took three weeks to do and one of my tech friends said, how did that take so long to do? I'm like, well, because I had to think about every single thing. How can I leave this room? How can this person leave the room? And so a tech process as such just being the programming probably would take just 10 minutes. But when you're actually critically using the tech to engage with like, all these paradigms, then you, you get to that space of something taking three, three weeks. And um, for Windrush, um, I had... Um, I, my work wasn't shown for Windrush. I um, made a gifts, um, but they were distributed um, in Caribbean communities here and amongst academics, and one of them will be shown in the British Library. Um, and I, I, I took the, 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 the iconic image of Windrush which we always see in print. It's a print image. It brought it into the digital world and then used, um, put on that prow of that ship people from the, who've been here in Britain since the 13th century onwards. And the, the gif is simply that the boat moves, but the people don't. So the people are already here. So, and I have a more complex gif. I don't know if you can find it on the website. Maybe you can see it, which actually shows um, the... Um, the complexity of the Windrush moment there's, as not a lineal thing. So it's, it, it, the complexity of the German past of that history of that boat. Windrush was called Monte Rosse. It was actually a, a Nazi holiday boat before it became Windrush. And all of that complexity is worked out, including Windrush Square, which I have sliding, where I have the chairs. There are chairs nailed down in Windrush Square, um, sliding off the, uh, the square which I'm tilting and they're falling into the river Windrush which is a river in Oxford which has got nothing to do with what actually Windrush actually means that migration or anything and I also have the, the, the bicycle that's called the Windrush bicycle and the caravan that's the Windrush caravan and there's a whole jumble of things just to make this super complex um, so why this work was, so that was work that was funded by the Kuriski network the, my question is um, I want to show how I'm working iteratively and those works are always in conjunction with community and because I can distribute them amongst community they respond to me and tell me what they need to see next and then I do make it. So um, my work is really networked and I lose control in the process and success for me is when the work is still very loud and clear and works for very many communities but without sacrificing the complexity of, of, of what's being said. Sorry, got okay, yeah, no, but it's not, it's still not my... Not, not, yeah, I, I know it's not ideal. Oh, so it's fine. So maybe just go to the digital works and we can yeah. just maybe show some of them. So the sculptural works are all performing furniture because I think furniture is an excellent metaphor for how we... Un for society and for some people who are holding everything up whereas some people are sitting. So the question is, do you live a furnished life or not? 
Um, if we go on to digital works, then maybe I can show that. Um, what moving me to work digitally was a lack of access to arts organisations, being a single mum, having a low income, having precarious living and little storage space. Um, a lot of my work is using very expensive furniture, 18th century furniture that's heavy. That's partly the point to dis dis deconstruct those, those things. Still, um, but That's what I've been doing. And so, so actually, when people are talking about digital identities or how does identity, how can we make a diverse space? Well, some of us are forced to be in that space, uh, not through choice, but through lack of resources. And the only thing when things come down is I still have my laptop. If my laptop breaks, ah, you know. But like I can, I can, I can still make with my laptop even if I don't have anything else. And um, very recently, I've just started a, a, a space um, in Germany called the, um, the Center for the Periphery, and it's about peripheral arts practitioners meeting in a peripheral space. It's a very large space. Um, just to work together without agendas, because I think this is really important. And I think this is where STEAM and STEM spaces are trying to do. But I, I, I kind of want to do it with artists who, who, who are not going to be monetized, because a lot of the problem with, with STEM is that I feel the artist comes in and you know, helps all the engineering, all the maths and the business, but then <laughs> the artist is just like not involved in that financially. So it's like really just like our spaces, like our atelier spaces. My atelier is in Germany because I can afford it there. In England, barn spaces are super sexy. They're now um, like loft, the conversions, people live there. Well, this is, the, this is the one that I was talking about earlier, about the chair pose. So this is... <laughs> that was, so basically I just swapped them. So this is the plantation. He comes to chair pose and the person who was in chair pose leaves. But not only he leaves, but also the animals and the plants that, were, that are also trapped in this, in this type of furniture leave as well. Um, and there's a lot of my work is about thinking about the divisions between people, things, animals, to think about um, the Anthropocene and um, technology in that way. So um, this was selected by, um, uh, this was shown in um, Jamaica National Gallery. And uh, that's wonderful because the first, people to, the first time to show my work was in the Caribbean. There's often this dis disconnect between the Caribbean and technology, which I think is not correct um, and part of, part of the problem. So will, um, will iterative modes of production help us to create more diversity? No. <laughs> um, but some, no, we're not all here through choice in, in the digital space. Um, and... and, and um, yeah, and my continued agency is also different. So that's just something that I can, I can share with you. And um, thanks so much for listening. <laughs>